Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Alum Fellows Reading Series. We are delighted to welcome back Jenny Sharp and Peter Hume. Both were Stuart Hall Fellows here at the Hutchins Center. Peter Hume will be introducing Jenny Sharp and discussing immaterial archives with her. He is Emeritus Professor of Literature at the University of Essex, and his scholarship has focused on the Caribbean and the development of post-colonial studies. Among his many illustrious books are Colonial Encounters, Europe and the Native Caribbean, 1492-1797, Remnants of Conquest, The Caribs and Their Visitors, 1877-1998, and most recently, The Dinner at Gonfarones, Salomon de la Selva's Pan American Project in Nueva York. Um, welcome to you both. And now the floor is yours, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Krishna. Um, let me start with an apology. As you might see, I'm sitting outside. My broadband at home went down 15 minutes ago. Um, so I'm outside the public library in a small town in Northern England. Um, I apologize for looking windswept and apologies for any um, traffic noise that you might pick up in the background. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jenny Sharp today. Um, she's Professor of English, Comparative Literature and Gender Studies at UCLA, Chair of Graduate Studies in the English Department. Um, I first knew her through the first book that she wrote, Allegories of Empire, the figure of woman in the colonial text, which established her as a leading critic within what at that time was only just, we were talking about 1993, coming to be called post-colonial studies. And Allegories of Empire, I think, is now regarded as a classic within that field. It provided historically grounded readings of Anglo-Indian fiction to show how representations of interracial rape helped manage a crisis in British colonial authority around the time of the 1857 Indian Rebellion. That book's geographical focus is on India. Her subsequent work has mostly been on the Caribbean or the Black Atlantic. Um, her second book, Ghosts of Slavery, a literary archaeology of black women's lives was published in 2002. And that looks at very closely, in fact, at the lives of three Caribbean women, um, in particular, the Jamaican Maroon leader, Nani, uh, one of Jamaica's national heroes, the woman known as Joanna, um, who features in John Gabriel Stedman's narrative of his expedition against the revolted Negroes of Suriname. And thirdly, the author of one of the classic 19th century Caribbean texts, Mary Prince, History of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave. All three of them women who negotiated for power within the constraints of the slave system. And it's one of the first books that really looks seriously at um, the lives and experiences of Caribbean women. As Krishna mentioned, um, Professor Sharp was Stuart Hall Fellow here in the Hutchins um, Centre working on the book which uh, we're celebrating the publication of today, Immaterial Archives and African Diaspora Poetics of Loss. Um, in her acknowledgments to that book, Professor Sharp notes that her year at the Hutchins Centre left an indelible mark on her writing and being in the world, um, a sentiment which is surely shared by all of us who've been uh, lucky enough to spend time at uh, that remarkable place. Um, so what's going to happen is that Jenny will give an outline of her book and then a reading from it. Um, and then we'll have a conversation. So let me just say by way of introduction that Immaterial Archives is a very rich tapestry. Uh, the threads within it include the relationship between the Black Caribbean and the Black USA, voodoo-inspired aesthetics, narrative theory, slavery studies, um, 
all that and more and all studied with close readings of some of the most challenging of um, contemporary Caribbean texts. I think the leading motif perhaps is captured by a sentence in the introduction which describes the book as proceeding, um, this is a quotation, by way of transactions, exchanges and conversations both real and imagined between history writing and the creative arts. And that, that transaction between history and fiction obviously has always been a thorny issue. Um, I don't think though you'd find a more stimulating or nuanced approach to it than in immaterial archives. So I'll hand over now to Professor Sharp to explain more about the book and then we'll have a conversation about it. Jenny. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. And thank you to Krishna and Abby for the invitation to be back at the Hutchins Center. I wish this was taking place in person and we could enjoy all those wonderful uh, discussions over dinner, meals and drinks, but we must save that wish for another time, perhaps given the topic of my book, it is fitting that we from three different parts of the globe are meeting in cyberspace and I want to also uh, welcome all, everybody who is watching um, this, uh, this webinar. I cannot see you, you can see me. I know there are students and colleagues, friends and family members out there. So I want to just speak directly to you and say hi. I also want to say what an honor it is to have Peter Hume uh, as a discussant because his own work and attention to history has been so formative of my approach, particularly the, his effort to construct a radical history out of uh, colonial documents in his book, Colonial Encounters. So uh, going back to that book, I noticed that um, its epigraph is Brathwaite's Islands poem. So we, we, I'm sure we have a lot to share in terms of our interests. So right now I'm going to give a uh, brief um, uh, visual presentation of the materials because they are very visual. So I would like you to see them. So I'm gonna get, switch to share screen. Immaterial Archives addresses the paucity of documentary evidence concerning the lives of black people during slavery and post-slavery eras but not by treating contemporary art and literature as an alternative archive, which is how literature as neo-slave narrative tends to be read. Rather, it focuses on those Caribbean writers and artists who localize European archives and their accompanying notions of the human by infusing material documents with African-derived epistemologies. This is why my study centers on formal innovations more so than storytelling. Nubesi Philip fragments the words belonging to an 18th century document of the kind we traditionally associate with the archive for creating her concrete poems on Zong massacre of enslaved Africans who were thrown overboard so that the ship's owners could collect insurance for their quote, lost cargo. Her readings have increasingly become a sacred ceremony. And here you see her uh, uh, in an event that was called Zong, hashtag Zong Global 2020. It occurred on Zoom. And uh, you can see from her attire that she is clearly uh, honoring uh, the dead and remembering the lives of those lost to the Middle Passage. Hashtag Zong Global 2020 was a durational uh, reading of Zong over a number of days, connecting people in different parts of the globe but only for that brief moment in time. As an ephemeral memorialization, the readings were archived to be made public again on November 29th, 2021, the anniversary of the first day of a calculated massacre. So that archiving and then bringing it back again is um, some of the sort of ephemeral approaches to archival materials that my study is getting at or attempting to get at. The next uh, um, author that I address is the Jamaican fiction writer, Erna Broadbur, who is a trained historian. And for her dissertation under Camel Brathwaite, 
collected oral histories from the second generation of Jamaican freemen. She is also known for writing fiction that avoids direct storytelling in favor of puzzles, parables, and cryptic plots, requiring an in intimate knowledge of Jamaican vernacular culture, which is a repeatedly experience she describes with self-irony as, quote, dragging people through bushes and weeds. Through their incorporation of embodied memory forms that Diane Taylor calls the repertoire, the artwork of Haitian Franz Zeferin and Haitian American Edouard Duval Carrier exists as meta commentaries on European archives by shifting definitions of the human away from a Christian frame of reference toward the sacred cultures of voodoo and a Haitian revolutionary past. I characterize Zeferin's painting as the outcome of a conversation between a self-taught artist and a university trained historian, Marcus Redeker, whose interest in Haitian arts lies in his effort to understand it as a site for popular histories. And you can see here, uh, Zephyrin is, is creating this painting in his studio in Pittsburgh. And the painting was eventually purchased by Redeker. And um, in a conversation between the artist and the historian, they named it the Brooks, the slave ship Brooks. And, but it is a very, completely different visualization of that abolitionist drawing if you are familiar with it. Um, I don't have time to talk about this painting. There's a lot that can be said, but I do want to point out that the, um, the rebel slaves who are chained to the outside of the ship, of the slave ship, belong to Haitian or oral history. And two of them who are broken free and are raising their fists are the heroes of the Haitian revolution, Dati Bookman and Toussaint Louverture. My chapter focuses on the small ship in the background, uh, which is the uh, Veve for Agwe, one of the sea uh, spirits, and, and La Sirene is also a sea spirit. But mostly what I was trying to emphasize is following the small uh, stories um, of uh, escape to freedom between the Caribbean islands, which is quite different from the big story of the slave ship that you see in something like the slave trade database where there are like thousands of records, but it only tells the slave ship story. La Sirene and Agwe as Siloa introduce a voodoo perspective of water as a crossroad to Guinan, home of ancestral spirits. With the reflecting cereal as the water's surface, Duval Carrier's installation, the Indigo Room, embraces a voodoo geography of the crossroads involving fluidity and movement across the human and the spirit's worlds. And he created this installation uh, working in collaboration with the students of the Diller Center for Arts at Fort Lauderdale. And many of these students were um, the children of Haitian and Jamaican immigrants to Florida. So it is much more of a kind of Haitian American, uh, Haitian diasporic perspective. <clears throat> As spectators, we are below the sea looking up, which reverses the perspective of European maps that gaze down on the Caribbean from the heavenly skies. But Duval Carrier is doing more than simply reversing perspectives. He is also making visible the invisible because dominant frame of reference for the planet and its geography. As he further explains about his propensity to represent underwater worlds. In African culture, everything moves underwater, contrary to the Western culture in which everything goes in the cosmos. His words indicate how a Judeo-Christian cosmology influences our sense of space and place, even in a secular and scientifically verifiable world since maps are drawn from the omniscient perspective of the heavenly skies or today's modern satellites. I have selected works that distort and fragment official archives and even when introducing alternative sites of memory do not present them as external to Western forms of representation due to slavery breaking African cultures in a way that allowed no return to original wholeness. As Kamal Brathwaite has so movingly described and extensively theorized. The slave ship's hold was both a wound and creative space 
My book describes Brathwaite as a visionary Bajan poet, historian, and cultural critic. And I would like to honor his memory since he died a little over a year ago by reading from the chapter that is devoted to the long history of his work, particularly his dream stories that draw on Rastafarian prophecy and voodoo dream states for combining myths, memories, allegories, and dreams in computer generated fonts and typography he calls his Sycorax vi video style. This page is from a dream story that unfolds at Harvard uh, it's about the time he spent there uh, in the year, I think, 1988 as a Fulbright scholar. And it was such an unseasonably hot August day that the university had to close. And Brathwaite describes that heat as the tropical heat drifting from Jamaica to Harvard. Brathwaite was introduced to his first Apple computer in the summer of 1988 when he was a Fulbright fellow, um, fellow at Harvard where he rented the machine from a student store. Now, um, this uh, machine <laughs> looks quaint by today's standard, but it was one of the earliest machines to really put um, the kind of creative potential of the computer using fonts and typography into the poet's hands together with the image writer printer, also looking rather quaint. The new poetic style emerged from a period of deep loss. The death of his wife, Doris, who was his lifelong companion and archivist of his work, the destruction of his personal library that he describes as a loss of his personal memory because it constituted his own distinctive assemblage of a Caribbean cultural history and a home invasion in which the intruder put a gun to his head, shooting a ghost bullet that left a gaping wound in the depths of his imagination. From this loss would emerge a writing style that defied conventions of prose and poetry writing through their use of pictograms, ideograms, dancing words on the page. Uh, and this particular instance is a reference to part, what I also think I'm, um, the illusion of immaterial, the lack of value given to its own culture in his home of Barbados where um, they, um, he, they, the government tried to appropriate the land that he had purchased for building a cultural center and housing in his archives for, for expanding the airport for tourism. And uh, we see this throughout the Caribbean. The poems are accompanied by very like geometric signs and pixel drawings resembling crabs, spiders, birds, frogs, as well as the profile of a woman's face. His pictogram for Doris whom he called Zaya Mexican in allusion to a Guyanese mixed African Amerindian heritage. And um, I put her in the, in, in the computer screen because he sees Sycorax as the spirit that is inhabiting his computer and uh, allowing him to create the, this new style of writing. Uh, but my chapter describes the living woman now deceased who is the spirit in the machine. Brathwaite christened the new poetics of his Sycorax video style after the powerful conjure woman in Shakespeare's Tempest, claiming that she resided within his Apple computer. As he explains in the passage serving as the chapter's epigraph, Sycorax appeared to the poem, poet in a dream and dreamed for him a Macintosh computer. His presentation of the streams of computer code, IO, as Pathways to Loire suggests an interface between computer memory and black diasporic memory, along with the shared immateriality of their forms. Like electronic files hidden deep within the computer hard drive, this is pre-internet days, so um, the computers were relatively independent machines, to be retrieved at a future point in time, the African gods and spirits were driven underground to a land of linguistic silence, awaiting their unspoken yet felt summoning on the other side. My chapter's title is Dream Stories, The Virtuality of Archival Recovery. And I'm going to read a section explaining Brathwaite's philosophy of history as a diagramming of African diaspora memory within the imagination, which Brian Masumi considers as especially suitable for unleashing 
the potential of virtuality due to the imagination being a space of quote, thinking feeling that can diagram without stilling. So let me get out of the share screen and move to reading. Throughout the long span of his poetic career, Brathwaite has always been attentive to the gods and spirits that inhabit the Caribbean world, not in their original form, but as they emerged from the wreckage of the Atlantic crossing. But the Nam Nomo capsule is not merely a machine, he declares, about the ancestral spirits who accompanied enslaved Africans in the ship's hold. If that was so, our African New World gods would have arrived awesome, not crippled, cold, and dead. Brathwaite's characterization of ancestral spirits as cold and dead does not mean that they were forgotten. As Nubesi Philip explains about embodied memory forms, it's not a question of forgetting as the antithesis of remembering because, quote, when the African came to the new world, she brought with her nothing but her body and all the memory and history which that body could contain, end of quote. In his description of the Middle Passage gods belonging to Jamaica and Nancy, Cuban Orishas, and Haitian Loa, Bradley writes against what he calls the Greek symmetry of balanced thought. The gods, he declares, do not survive. They wait, they listen, they remain, as ancient and as modern as the morning star. The Middle Passage gods are both ancient and modern because they are the same as their African origins, but also transformed. He proceeds to explain how his own work is bitten, bitten, written by these gods, expressing the feeling for the word, the song and the cadent vocal, and the sense of contradiction, fragments, whole. To think of Brathwaite's description of fragments and wholeness as working against Greek symmetry is to see the potential for wholeness in the fragment that cannot be made whole again. As Colin Dion tell, tellingly observes, no other poet has recognized so fully the power in fragments, the pull of detritus on the life of the spirit. The power of fragments is evident in the poet's computer generated style, which stitches together scraps and pieces of earlier poems, letters and documents in a manner that leaves their seams exposed. Brathwaite was filled with the sense of contradiction between word fragments in, and their cadence and song, when he began experimenting on Doris's computer after her death. As his fingers moved across the letters on the keyboard of what was previously a cold and dead machine, he felt a silent and unseen spirit move him. Brathwaite characterizes his computer-generated poetics as writing in light, a phrase that alludes not only to the light of the computer screen, but also to the vision the new form of writing provides since it enables him to bring visibility to the spoken word. Brathwaite's description of the computer as connecting pre-literacy to post-literacy bends what he calls the missile logic of a progress-driven modernity back upon itself to resemble the curved space and non-linear temporalities of African cosmologies he likens to round objects such as pebbles and capsules. The missile stands for a Western modernity identified equally with its soaring buildings of Gothic spires and skyscrapers as its projectile weapons of missiles and spears. The circle represents not only the target on the backs of subjugated peoples, but also the hole through which they, quote, crashed into history. And that is Brathwaite's phrase. The Haitian Revolution as the first successful slave revolt that would inspire countless others across the Americas constitutes one such disruption of the smooth passage of historicist time. Alluding to the hurtling of the Haitian Revolution into Western history, Brathway presents space capsule logic as the kernel of hope that widens like ripples formed by dropping a pebble in water. And this is Brathwaite's words. From capsule core, religion nam, the circles widen outward, back, explode, at times of crisis in response to dream or hope or vision. The widening ripples allude to a related concept of tidal ectics as tidal flows that go back and forth without synthesis, which Brathwaite offers as an alternate to the progress-driven narrative of our Hegelian dialectics. My reason for focusing on the astrophysical metaphor of the rocket ship and space capsule 
rather than the oceanic one of tidal flows, has to do with Brathwaite's description of capsule logic as a response to not only hope, but also dreams and vision, the immaterial forms of which open the imagination to affects, temporal incongruities, and the limitless potential of virtuality. The space capsule contains the atomic core of Nam, and uh, this is the core of spirit, um, which is etymologically an African word, but also a spelling of man backwards thereby representing for Brathwaite the human core of slaves that Western humanism masks. According to his missile and capsule model, a rocket ship launched from African, uh, West African shores and landed in the Americas, but it was not the end of the journey because diasporic Africans traveled imaginatively, quote, back across the Atlantic in the other direction. Due to it, it, it expressing the temporality of a diasporic modernity, the curvature of cas capsule logic is not simply a return to a pre-colonial African past. Brathwaite's merging of science, technology, magical realism, and African cosmologies embraces the sensibility of Afrofuturism, particularly through an allusion to the Middle Passage as a futuristic alien abduction, suggested by his comparison of slaves in the ship's hold to the quote, capsule powered by that rocket of the slave trade. And he wrote this in 1983. The Afrofuturism of his computer generated poetics performs what he calls an alter native move by abducting a modern machine and transforming it into a gateway to Guinan, home of ancestral spirits, but also the recently deceased. And I'll end there and turn it over to Peter. Peter, are you there? I'm there? Yeah. Um, I start my video. Yep, I'm there. Um, <laughs> Jenny, let's I mean, start with the obvious place with, with, with the title. Um, mm -hmm. Can we broach this question of archives? I mean, you do situate your book in the introduction within what's sometimes now referred to as the archival turn and I think we all kind of know about archives and, and history but I know you teach a course at UCLA called the archival turn in literature theory I mean could you explain just what that is I mean is the archival turn a positive development is it particularly relevant for post-colonial studies black Atlantic studies and, and what kind of context does it provide for what you're doing in your book? Um, yes, so the archival turn, um, as I say in my introduction, is a, a, a huge um, body of work that involves not only uh, literary studies, but performance studies, anthropology, history, art history to a number of other fields. And um, I think Ann Stolo sort of says it best where uh, she says, in the archival term, the archive is not the same object. And I think the archival term is where the archive is treated as an object of study and not simply a source of mm -hmm. information about the past. But she says the, ar uh, the archive is not the same object for historians and literary critics because for historians, it refers to a body of materials. And whereas for the literary critic, it's a metaphor and therefore the archive can, can mean anything and has, I think. And I may be accused of being a literary critic of in fact, using it in that way um, and guilty, I would say. But I, what I tried, I'm, I take the kind of criticism made, particularly Carolyn Steedman's in Dust, where she takes mm. Derrida to task for his archive fever. And she does, he's not really, he pretends to be talking about uh, the Freudian archive, but really he's talking about psychoanalysis, right? Yeah. So um, I take that criticism quite seriously, which is why I say I put literature into conversation with history and I, I choose works um, that uh, are the product of that conversation. And I choose also to write about, um, I choose um, 
literary figures like Bradbury and Brathwaite who are trained historians and also very active in history writing and the recovery of black histories. Um, Brathwaite was the first to, in fact, go to the archives and recover Nanny, right, from, from, the, from those very small fragment, fragments at the time that she was being made into a national hero in Jamaica in 19, around 1975. So um, the, you know, so I, I, I intentionally work on literary um, figures who take the archives very seriously. But what I try to get at is what are they doing in their literary work or poetic work that the archives cannot do for them or that kind of material history. And, uh, and so that at that sort of interface of the way historians approach the archives and the kind of creative approach like Philip, who is a legal, I mean, sort of given she has a law degree, she knows her legal history, she um, decides to just destroy that document, a poetic destruction of mm -hmm. it by breaking apart its words, right? So when I look at this poetic act, I ask then what, does, what can it do in terms of black memory um, uh, that is different? I'm not saying that it's better. I'm not saying that, um, you know, we should all do it. I mean, you know, we should forget history. I'm saying it's different. It's another plane of representation. And mostly what I was uh, trying to get at is how are they changing the rules of the representation itself by infusing it in, in particularly Brathwaite. Um, I, I, since I just read it, I mean, all of them are doing it to a certain extent, but infusing it with um, the diasporic African epistemologies. Okay. Um, another term that I was intrigued by noticing that in your previous book, um, you talk about the ghost of slavery, a literary archaeology of Black women's lives. So I was intrigued by the relationship between the archival and the archaeological. I mean, there is that sense, I guess it goes back to Arturo Schomburg's The Negro Digs Up His Past, this sense of digging up of the archaeological work, which is a necessary process of, of recovery. I mean, is there a continuity between that and what you're doing in this book, in other words, between your previous work and this work, do you see them as being a different kind of project or, or a continuation of the same sort of work? They're related but different. Uh, my subtitle of that book, Ghosts of Slavery, a Literary Archaeology of Black Women's Lives, refers directly to Toni Morrison's phrase that she calls her historical novels a literary archaeology. And by that she means that when she was trying to write perhaps uh, the story from the fragment of a newspaper report of Margaret Gardner, she's very insistent that she was not interested in finding more historical evidence to sort of piece together that story. And that's why it's a literary archeology. span She was trying more to kind of um, uh, create an emotional memory. And I think it's closer, it has more of an effective uh, quality. So it's a related project, but different. And I think it kind of um, generated a number of works, including Broadway's Louisiana, a number of particularly uh, black women writers who kind of, who were inspired by Morrison and wrote um, in that same way. Uh, and so the second book was very much in that spirit and um, how do we tell these stories? This book sort of um, is not focusing so much on the storytelling or how we can use literature to kind of flesh out um, the lives of the past, but much more looking at the formal intervention and looking at epistemologies, the underlying epistemologies for how we think of, um, you know, how we, how we think of what constitutes an archive and what doesn't. And even as the archive has been expanded and my 
my book, you know, begins with your traditional archives, like the National Archives. The second uh, chapter looks at emb embodied memory forms, the voodoo in the painting. And then the Broadbur is the oral histories, right? right? And then the fourth one is um, in Brathwaite, it's the digitiz dig digitization of archives, right? The, being their conversion today, archives, the material are being converted into these digital. And part of the question I'm raising there is, um, you know, what gets saved, what doesn't, you know, what, you know, I address what archives during the colonial era gets taken back to Europe to these big um, holding houses and which ones the residual materials that are left behind in the Caribbean, practically every single, um, um, you know, library in the Caribbean has been destroyed by uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, there's no money to restore them. So we, we're the, the kind of solidity that we associate with material or physical archives is very precarious over there in the Caribbean. And um, so that's also kind of bringing that precarity and that destruction into something that we see as a little more uh, solid and stable. A different kind of question. I mean, since we were both Stuart Hall Fellows at the Du Bois, um, you, you, there's just one mention, I think, of, of Stuart's work uh, in your book about diaspora, but I know you've written about it elsewhere. And I, I kind of imagine that Stuart's approach was influential in this current book in ways which are perhaps not made manifest. Could you say something about his presence within, behind your, your idea of African diaspora poetics? Yeah, Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall is so central to my thinking that I don't cite him, right? <laughs> uh, but my prior books do. You know, my first book, Allegories of Empire, spends a lot of time talking about um, his, um, his idea of encoding and decoding ideology and the oppositional form of decoding ideology, he says, changes the rules. And so in some ways I'm doing that here I, without quoting him because I quoted him in the first book. And Peter, you and I both were introduced to the Marxist Stuart Hall before we were oh, introduced did. to the Black British and the di you know, African diaspora Stuart Hall. Um, and so, yeah, so um, there's that really long history of his thought that has been so influential. And I think influential on you and I who work in post-colonial studies, because I, I say this in, I do say this in the in, um, immaterial, uh, no, in the essay you mentioned, the one that I wrote to honor Stuart Hall's uh, memory uh, after his death. Um, where uh, Grant Farrell calls him a black post-colonial intellectual. And mm. I think that's true because um, he always has that double, really that doubleness of not only Black Britain, but also uh, the Caribbean and Jamaica and what's going on there. So his idea uh, of diaspora, and in fact, he uh, is very much at work in my book. Um, and um, that is the, the, the kind of poetics I'm looking at is, is very much Caribbean and involves the creolization, which is so important to the culture. Um, and while um, there are definitely some similarities um, across the Atlantic, you know, in terms of, you know, the kind of, um, it, I call it African derived, clearly you can see these connections, but you also see transformations and transformations in response to the conditions of slavery. So there's slight changes and it's, it's really in response to that condition and a kind of political act in that sense. It's a decoding even of those kinds of um, memory forms and practices. And um, so there's not, on the one hand, there's the difference between um, the kind of uh, uh, cultural forms in the Caribbean and in um, West Africa. And on the other hand, he talks about differences across the Caribbean when he made uh, the film Redemption Song and he traveled across mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. differences. 
And I notice in your own work, like in, in lamb, on lambing and seeds of revolt, you talk about not just simply situating uh, lambing in the Anglophone tradition, but having to look at the Spanish and the French. And in fact, you, you say the innovation comes from that, some, that those traditions that are outside, right? Outside yeah. of the Anglophone, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just on, on Stuart, I, so I've just been very struck. I've been reading through the essential essays, those two volumes that Duke have published, and they're just about to bring out, I think, a, a collection of essays on race and difference. And it's, it's because Stuart never published a single authored book during his lifetime. It's such now a different experience being able to read essay after essay after essay and really get a sense of him as a as a Caribbean thinker in a way which it was never quite possible before. And he, he was there, but he was there in talks and the odd essay. Now there's a, a really quite massive body of work being published. It's like a almost a, a rediscovery or a new discovery of of a whole way of thinking, which is, is really very exciting, I think. Um, you, you mentioned Lamming. I, mean, I was struck, I was thinking about Stuart and Lamming mm -hmm. and thinking about that, um, that and, and Brathwaite as well, that extraordinary generation of Caribbean thinkers and intellectuals who were all, if you can add in, well, Fanon, Glissant, all were born within a few years of each other in the late 20s and early 30s. A really remarkable body of work. And, and Lamming, I was struck by the fact, again, it's only perhaps a passing mention in your book, but you do, um, you do mention him. And, and going back to the pleasures of exile and that description that he offers at the beginning of the book of a voodoo ceremony that he'd witnessed in, in Port-au-Prince, which I can see now sort of sets up Pleasures of Exile in a way which I hadn't really realised before. I mean, are those pages of Lamings significant for an African diaspora poetics? Are they the beginning of some kind of critical tradition there, do you think? Well, absolutely. If you consider when he was writing them, you know, when he was writing these words in the, in the Pleasures of Exile, um, he visited, I think he visited Haiti in 1955. And again, these are early years where there, he, he can't articulate exactly what he saw. He calls it the ceremony of the souls, you know, yeah. and it is, the ceremony is actually to remove the spirits from the water. You know, and it is a ceremony where um, the Ongan removes the spirits uh, and they can converse with their family and friends and, and settle disputes and uh, in order to go on with their lives in the future. And so, um, but he, he talks about, and he talks about it in a small corner in the cradle of the Caribbean, he witnessed this, right? And then he uses it to me, it's not just that he's describing the ceremony, but then he goes on to describe a BBC radio broadcast as the British version of, of, of heartening the spirits, the voices of the past, right? And um, he, you know, so he completes, so to me, he, he's changing the rules, right? He's now uh, saying, we are not some primitive tribal people there who believe the spirits. Look at you guys, you know, what you're doing. And you, it's called the radio. It's a machine. He calls the engineers the, the priests. And um, the line I love in, in that he ends with when he says um, that what he is saying might be, might be called inaccurate or erroneous. He says, but if so, it's an error lived by millions. Mm. And I love that line. I love it. <laughs> I mean, that's colonization, right? So he's basically saying, you know, I mean, <laughs> I could, your, your colonization. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I am throwing this back in your face, you know? So I, I think it's a very radical um, move that he makes. And I think it is enabled by, um, the witnessing of this ceremony that clearly left a deep impression on him. And it is the beginning of what I'm talking about um, in these other writers. Okay. 
one maybe this will, this may be the last question, but it's a, it's a very big one, really. Um, it's something that I that I often struggle with. Um, I mean, reading again the the books that you talk about, particularly Zong um, mm -hmm. and Louisiana, um, in some ways they they both look like works of high modernism. I mean, that that you you showed that that shot of a of a page from Zong, which looks like Malarmé's un coup de day, mm -hmm. and Louisiana could be a, a kind of meta-historical fiction, a piece of magical realism, almost. I mean, what, what exactly do you see as the relationship between this kind of high modernist element within Caribbean writing and the, the, this, this diaspora poetics, which seems so removed from the world of high modernism. I mean, is there a connection between them? Are they are they working counter to each other? What's the relationship? Yeah, so I guess I would, you know, um, wouldn't call it um, high modernism so much as um, postmodern because there's a kind of meta commentary <laughs> aspect yeah. to all of it. And, um, and even with Philip, uh, but Bravo is the one who really kind of phrased it really well, because she writes these, these works that are very difficult to read. They're not literary realism. And uh, she's sort of, I mean, in, in conversation with me, she said that her community would say, why are you writing these books? You know, um, they're too hard to read. And she, and she, took offense with that. It's like, it's sort of like, why do you assume, you know, or even in the outside of the, because I'm a, you know, uh, Jamaican woman writer that I cannot write in this way, you know? Uh, so that's the first thing. And I don't think it's doing the same, but definitely it's writing in a, um, in a, in a form, I think Louisiana, is a modernist in the sense of the way that um, it it kind of does not have a linear narrative and it's got these um, you know kind of um, um, frames you know sort of similar to say Heart of Darkness mm -hmm. you know the telling and the frame and yeah, yeah. the documents right um, and Philip also is very clear that she writes concrete poetry but she very explicitly says and and I think. Every word is carefully chosen that her poems begin from, quote, the wasteland between the terror of language and the horror of silence. So we could not, we could say waste, oh, wait, wait, wasteland, Elliot, horror, you know, Conrad, you know, but she is <laughs> saying, no, don't put, don't put it, that phrase in terms of this great European tradition uh, reference. No, it refers to the uh, the breaking of, of of language in the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean and the literal cutting out of the tongue of slaves who spoke their mother language, you know, which was a form of punishment. So it's like what she's trying to say is that, you know, I'm writing poetry, but before you put it into that frame, mm -hmm. you know, stop and, um, and, and, and think about what I am writing about. And I just want to show, actually go back to the, I'm going to share, I just want to go back to the, um, the Duval Carrier, because I talk about this um, aspect of his, of his art um, in terms of its relationship to the modernist grid um, so, so Duval Carrier uses the, this form, you've seen it in Mondrian, you, I mean, this is mm -hmm. a very clearly a modernist form in the modernist grid, but the modernist um, grid has a minimalism to it, okay, this is like overload, visual overload, and uh, I say what he does is he takes the kind of visual overload of the voodoo altar and puts it into each one of these little blocks. And in that sense, it's all, it serves as a meta commentary on the mod modernists who really uh, borrowed, or we can even say stole um, their 
their um, forms from uh, African and Oceanic arts, but they did it very selective, selectively. They selected, uh, say, the Fang mask that has very clean lines and uh, that minimalist aesthetics. It, it conformed to the Greek idea of symmetry, European idea of symmetry, and not the nail fetish, which seems too busy. So in some ways, what he's doing there is using that um, same uh, grid, the aesthetic, but also, um, sorry, I didn't, but also, um, you know, commenting on that act of appropriation. So I, I, so I think that's what, how you have to see the modernist elements in each of the works that I'm addressing. Thanks. I think we've gone over our time, well, we so have. better hand back to Krishna to uh, curate some q and I think. Mm -hmm. Hello, thank you. Um, we have a few questions. Um, one is by Hayan Abidir Rahman. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, who says, thank you very much for your generous work. I was deeply affected by immaterial archives. Your work is proof against this, but may I ask if you could speak to commentators who state that archival recovery is melancholic and impossible. So, um, thank you. I mean, I actually spend a long time um, um, talking about Stephen Best's essay uh, where he uh, mentions the kind of melancholic historicism that was initiated by Toni Morrison's beloved. And um, it's sort of um, um, obsessed with the middle passage and with death and with the kind of terrors of slavery. And uh, we're kind of locked into that. We cannot get out of it. And so my response um, is to where, you know, that's why I say, uh, I think it's uh, Brathwaite is really perfect because he always talks about the wound and the creativity, right? The wound of the middle passage, but also the kind of creativity that was already beginning. That is, if we accept the idea of slavery as social death, we are acceding to what the um, slave masters intended to do, right? Remove or strip the, um, the uh, slaves of their humanity and personhood. And so what I'm trying to look at is um, that our own focus on only that one side blinds us to a lot else that is going on. So for Philip, for instance, we can say on the one hand, it's, it's melancholic. She probably is the most melancholic if we want to call it out of all. And I, that's why I start with her because she is trying to recover the lives at the moment of death. I mean, the poem that I, I gave you when you hear, and, you, and, and again, this goes back to modernism too, because um, Caribbean uh, poetry is performative. So, mm -hmm. right, so it's not just the words on the page, but when she reads it, that's why I talk about she's slowing down language, she breaks it to such a degree that you hear kind of these gurgles and it sounds, sounds of drowning. And you can say that she is, on the one hand, it's melancholic, but why, she, why is she interested in death, but you could also say she is, all we have in the records is the death, right? So she's trying to sort of give that sort of show that to just focus on the death removes the personhood. And I talk about how the, in terms of the, even the anti-slavery writings, they focus a lot on death because they want, their objective is to end the slave trade. So. Uh, but we mustn't accede to the codes by which they are telling that particular story. And so, um, you know, what, what um, Philip wants to do is know the lives, the lives that cannot possibly be represented. And uh, for me, the br brilliant move of uh, those poems, and particularly the early ones where she's literally destroying uh, the words of the archival document, is that she's forcing them to speak what they cannot say. Mm 
right? They cannot speak the personhood of the enslaved Africans because they are described as cargo and property that has a monetary value. And she destroys the record in a way that she forces them to, 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 to release so in some ways between the, um, um, uh, you know, between the words in the very blank spaces on the page, the silence, um, she forces them to, to actually um, elicit the, that personhood that they cannot name. So. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions which are related to each other. Um, so many of the authors and artists you discuss are women. And how is the idea of the immaterial a gendered one? And mm -hmm. along with that, Al Alessandra Di Maio, who's a current fellow, says, thank you for a riveting talk. I'm intrigued by the notion of fragments and how it relates to the experience of loss and how central it is to Caribbean and diaspora archives. Are mm -hmm. fragments, as you see them, gender marked or are they defined by gender? So um, thank you, thank you, Alessandra. I, um, I know. <laughs> well, welcome to Hutchins, I should say. So um, yes, I, I begin with Philip, uh, who absolutely sees it as marked by gender. And I, you, and I put the context of the Zog poems, which don't necessarily center on black women in the context of Philip's earlier writing, where she sees silence as the space of the black woman. And, um, and she goes through it in all kinds of, it's the essay called Displace, and she um, breaks up the word. And so there's a space in the middle and that is the place, this place is the place of the black woman, right? So I, I do see it very much gendered in that instance. And um, in Broadbird too, um, the spirits, so these are the black, these are the black women writers, the spirits that um, enter the body of the anthropologist. And Peter, to go back to your question about uh, magical realism, uh, which is metaphoric and people read the spirits that enter her body metaphorically uh, as um, the oral stories. And I read it literally. I say that she pushes further on the boundaries of the supernatural in magical realism. And you know, to have an anthropologist who is a medium is, um, you know, and the anthropologist is a Hurston type figure. It was as if Hurston didn't just report on the spirit, uh, you know, what she saw, these exotic practices she saw in Jamaica and Haiti because she visited the place, them, right? She wrote on zombieism, for instance, in Haiti. But in fact, if um, Hurston herself was a, a medium and was um, a psychic, as the character is in her story. So the spirit voices are the spirits of um, Garveyites who were women. And it is a lost history because they are women. So I, I take very much, what I do is take the kind of black feminist writing and the modes that they associate with um, you know, with the female a black women's agency. And I extend it to the male artists or authors. And that's why I, I in Brathwaite, I sort of say that Brathwaite sees Doris as his muse. He sees Sycorax as this mythic figure, but behind what I try to see is how his his computer writing comes out of a partnership in life with Doris that he cannot recognize when she is alive and that only comes to the fore once she's dead. Um, and, um, and that there it is again, the hidden women's labor or work. And um, so I, you know, I'm sort of throughout trying to uh, recover uh, black women's agency. So I, it's very much, uh, one could say it even yeah, exists in the silent spaces and in the fragments. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, we're nearing the end of our hour. Um, Peter, would you have any final thoughts or questions? I mean, one thing I suppose which I I didn't get to to ask. A th a th I mean, it just picks up on something that that Jenny said. It's about that relationship between the visual and the oral. I mean, it is reading song again, and, and well, actually reading what you wrote about the performances of song. I was very struck by. by I mean, you, if you read the book, you would think, well. You can't perform it. It's it's unperformable, um, and there's something of a I don't know quite how to describe it. Something rich and strange. Something very very magical about that ability to combine the intensely visual and what from your I've never heard it, but from your account is the intense intensely oral quality of the of the poem. I mean that's something quite extraordinary that would be a, a, just a final a final thought and and, a, and, a, and i suppose a final compliment on the way in which you make that really come alive in that particular chapter thank you i mean and also so set your calendar for um november 29th because they will uh you will be able to see this oral performance what's interesting right. is every time it changes and this is the first time that it has the simultaneous multiple voices. Right. Which is just yet another level. And glow, you know, voices that are global, you know, separated in time, but using the um, Zoom, <laughs> using virtual space to actually bring them together. And so um, it's there is an instance where the technology then, um, you know, enhances. Yeah. Right, uh, something again, orality that we associate perhaps with uh, not with technology necessarily, and um, and uh, that's what I also like about the oral because again, it, it it if part of the archival term was to destabilize the archive. I mean, that was partly what you know that we no longer treat the archive as sort of. Uh, singular in terms of the evidence that they deliver, but they can mm -hmm. be stabilized, they can be supplemented, they can be, you know, I mean, people can go back to them again and again, and each time different meaning is, is, is derived. So um, if that, it's, it's similar to the performance, each time the performance of that, of those poems is different. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both for a, um, profoundly um, fascinating talk. Um, you're, it's very inspiring and I hope that it was time well spent for you both as well. Okay, thank you, Abby. I mean, That's Krishna. Krishna. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, thank, and thank you, uh, Liz Delurgri, my colleague uh, at UCLA. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>